So thank you for being here. I want to thank KC for, for organizing this. My name is Roger Royce. I'm the founder of the Royce Law Firm. We're a business, corporate, and tax law firm that services technology startups. And of course, Health Tech is one of our big initiatives. Um, this is the first of a series of events that we're going to be hosting for Pitch Global uh, throughout the year on Health Tech. Now, I know that not everybody is here yet, but I'd like to get a sense as to who's in the audience. How many tech startup entrepreneurs? My God, almost everybody. Um, any uh, product company, product people, you know, from bigger companies, from industry? Okay, a few. Well, okay, or smaller companies. <laughs> product people, all right. Um, investors, VCs? A few of them, okay. More, I know more are on the way for our later panels. Well, we are really excited and pleased today to be able to welcome uh, Professor Thomas Sudoff uh, to speak with us, to do a little bit of a fireside chat. And uh, we don't have a lot of time. I've got a few things I wanna, I wanna get across and I'm gonna open it up to a few questions from the audience. But for those of you who don't know, um, Thomas is a biochemist. He's known most for his study of synaptic transmission. He's a professor in a school of medicine in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Physiology and also in neurology and psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Stanford University. And of course, he is the uh, 2013 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine Laureate. Uh, pro <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, prior to that, uh, Thomas worked uh, 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 on a project uh, to describe the role of. The, you'll understand this more than I do because you're all you're all health tech people. The role of the LDL receptor in cholesterol metabolism. You know the statin drugs. So that was based on some fundamental research uh, that Thomas worked on for uh, two gentlemen who were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1985. So he's been at it a long time. Uh, Thomas has been at Stanford University since 2008, or as I said, he's a professor in various departments. And um, he's credited with discovering so many things. I mean, I printed it out, but I can't read all of the things, all of his accomplishments. Um, but like I say, probably what he's most well known for is brain science, you know, synapse formation. So with that, um, Dr. Suda, I think I would like to just ask you maybe to describe a little bit in, in layman's terms for me, um, what it is that, that, that you did uh, to be awarded the Nobel Prize. I am uh, originally a biochemist, but as science has developed over the last decades, we all have become interdisciplinary. So I wouldn't describe myself as um, a biochemist or a physiologist or whatever you want. It sort of fits. And that is also reflected by the fact that I am a member of so many different departments. I'm even a professor of neurosurgery, although I have blissfully never seen a patient in a OR, at least in a neurosurgeon OR. Anyway. My work originally focused on how one nerve cell sends a signal to another nerve cell during synaptic transmission. And that was the work that was honored by the Nobel Prize. And that work tried to understand how it is possible for a nerve cell to send a fast signal very precisely in a very, very short time. That was a mystery in many ways before we started because everyone knew that synapses transmit information within a few milliseconds. And everyone knew that that occurred because the chemical transmitter was being used as the signal. But it was a puzzle how it is possible for a nerve cell to send out this chemical signal so rapidly in such a short time. And our work that was honored by the prize, which I'm obviously very happy about, but I'm not sure 
You know, there's so many things you could buy, give prizes for, so I'm happy about it, but I don't think that it's necessarily so much more special than anything else. Anyway, that work explained in molecular terms how a nerve cell could do this. And the way it does this is that it packages the chemicals into little vesicles, and then it assembles a nanomachine directly at the synapse that enables incredibly rapid secretion of those chemicals. And that's basically it, what we did. Since then, our work has shifted. We now work on trying to understand better how the brain is wired, how it is possible for many, many synapses to form in the correct space and time, and how they change during synaptic plasticity. And we also work intensely on trying to understand what happens in diseases that affect those processes. Diseases such as neuropsychiatric disorders and neurodegenerative disorders. And that, in a nutshell, is my academic work that I'm performing in my lab at Stanford. OK, thanks very much. So um, we've got limited time, so I'm just going to jump right ahead to some of the later things that you've been noted for. And uh, when I Google your name, a lot of, a lot of articles pop up. Um, some of them, I don't know if they're controversial, but I know that you have very strong opinions about the role of basic fundamental research and how maybe, uh, because we have some product people in the audience, maybe you could speak to um, how important it is uh, you feel that that we have just basic research into how the brain works, for example, rather than forging right ahead, and, and, and as some companies do, to develop drugs to treat these diseases like Alzheimer's when we don't really understand them. Any comments on that? <laughs> so I always have to smile when somebody says that I have strong opinions. Um, <laughs> so. In addition to directing a lab, I'm very interested in drug development at a number of levels. And I'm working with a number of companies, mostly in an advisory role. One of the most depressing things about drug development at least as far as the brain is concerned over the last decades has been the lack of success in trying to combat neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, Huntington's. And I think that this is now beginning to change. But it took for those diseases for which there finally is progress, let's say Huntington's, it really took a huge investment in fundamental research in order to achieve that. I think in Alzheimer's disease, we are not there yet, but we are much closer than we were before. My previous comments that Roger refers to regarded the fact that many drug companies had performed extremely expensive trials using antibodies against EBITDA in particular for Alzheimer's disease that in the end turned out to be rather unsuccessful. I am not even persuaded by the recent Biogen results, which some of you may know, that there really is a major signal that one can rely on. And I feel that some of these trials may have been a little premature because they were based on the notion that a beta is the toxic agent in Alzheimer's disease and on the notion that giving an antibody to this would actually be helpful. Now, this notion is plausible to some degree, but after initial trials, failed so miserably, trying to sort of bore down on it and do it again and again seemed to me to be a waste of resources. And I still think so. So I think that in Alzheimer's disease, only recently has there been significant progress 
in a broader understanding of the disease. Only recently has there been appreciation that it is not just a beta that creates the disease. Although I feel that we need to have a very, very general perspective that in includes not only neurons, but also not only microglia, but that really includes an interaction between different types of cells in the brain and their dysfunction in order to understand the disease. And this is where I think we still need a lot of fundamental research because despite the recent progress, especially in genetics, we still don't understand the disease, or for that matter, I don't think we understand any neurodegenerative disease. Okay. Shift gears here a little bit. Because we have a room full of startup entrepreneurs, I would really be remiss if I did not take advantage of this opportunity to ask you to tell us a little bit about the future. Uh, especially the future of, of drugs, what sorts of drugs that you think um, companies will be developing, will it be biologics, small molecule? Uh, for the future, where are the opportunities here for, for our group of entrepreneurs? What's your opinion? And again, what, what is the best chance of success in battling these diseases that you've been describing? I'm not sure I'm the right person. You all know much better what the trends are. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of obvious. Um, currently, uh, it's, I feel almost like we are now beyond the apex, beyond the climax of the biologics as an approach, certainly in uh, disorders of the brain, but possibly even in cancer. Um, and. To me, it seems clear that the most exciting opportunities lie in manipulations that affect gene expression, RNA therapeutics, DNA therapeutics, gene, ex uh, gene therapy of one kind or another. Much of it is very much in the beginning, but as you all know, there's now so many gene therapy companies sprouting up everywhere. <laughs> so um, I think that um, the approaches that companies like Ionis or Alneman have uh, pioneered are incredibly promising, although the clinical trials still need to be done, and we'll see. But um, in general, I believe that these new therapeutic modalities have a much bigger promise, certainly for disorders, for neurodegenerative disorders, than, for example, antibodies. <laughs> so, so I'm going to ask you, before I turn it over to the audience and ask if the audience has some questions, uh, I'm going to ask you a question I don't think anyone's probably ever asked you before, uh, but I wonder about this. Because you know, I've I've seen um, very technical scientists before uh, have have to make a decision during their career, whether they're going to focus on and you do a lot of writing, whether they're going to focus on writing to a very scientific technical crowd and advance the science and the technology, or whether they're going to do something that's more accessible to the masses like me. And I've been reading some of the things you've been posting, uh, the Washington Post article, for example, and some of your other articles. And I wonder, does this signal a shift in your writing? Can we expect from you more, uh, more accessible explanations of, of the science and the brain and what you do? Or do you think you'll spend your career more focusing on, on the research that you're doing at Stanford? I would hope to do both because it is actually very hard for scientists like me to explain what we are trying to say in a way that other people understand us, um, especially the public. And I think that academic scientists have made a major mistake in the United States for sure, but also worldwide, in not paying more attention to communicating to the public. 
I feel that as academic scientists, we have too often emphasized that we need more money, which we of course do, but who doesn't? Um, <laughs> and not why we need it. And I think also that we have too often communicated to the public that the progress has been tremendous in the hope that that would give us a lot more money instead of admitting that the progress has been tiny and that's just what it takes. So especially for brain disorders, I think that um, you know the investment in understanding the brain is minuscule compared to the investment in cancer. Talking about societal burdens, however, disorders of the brain are at least as burdensome, both economically and in terms of personal suffering, as are disorders like cancer. With cancer, finally there is progress, I think. I have the impression. And although the majority of cancers still cannot be treated adequately, at least a minority can now be treated in a way that gives rise to hope. And that after all this investment. So I think we need to really communicate to the public that although there are opportunities of translating neuroscience research, those opportunities are still small because the progress in trying to understand the diseases of the brain has been very little. And we have to admit, and I think that's what you're referring to, we have to admit that we need to make a lot more progress if we really want to be able to actually help those people who are affected by these diseases. Any questions from our audience here? <laughs> Let me restate the question. So you're asking for Tom's perspective on the fact that it, uh, pharma companies have a tremendous amount of risk. There's a lot of failure. They have to put a lot of money into R&D. And because of that, um, they shouldn't be criticized for the profits that they might make from, from a product. So, so what about that, Tom, uh, uh, how pricing kind of plays into all of this? And does it affect how much money actually goes into the research, I guess, is a follow-up to your question. <laughs> So for a purpose of disclosure, I am on the board of directors for Sanofi. Sanofi has been one of the companies, in particular in terms of insulin, that has been attacked significantly, put it this way. Um, I deal with pricing issues six times a year, okay. Um, and I do think that mistakes were made by the big companies, many companies, including Sanofi sometimes, in terms of pricing and in terms of communicating pricing. I think there needs to be a balance. The balance needs to be between having a reasonable price for innovative medicines that change patients' lives and that required a huge investment to develop. And I believe that those innovative medicines deserve a high price. But I also think that once the medicines are no longer innovative, once they've been on the market for decades, then there should be a process that ensures that generics actually are generally accessible to the population at a reasonable price. So I think that sometimes these market mechanisms that were devised and make a lot of sense the pra in practice, sometimes they don't work. But in general, I believe that the overall organization of having this mechanism whereby investment in innovation pays off is perfectly justified, as long as the other half of the bargain, that in future, those medicines become more affordable for people, is also kept. That is my personal opinion. Okay, thank you. Uh, you, were, you had your hand up. Or, no, you did. That's right. Someone in front here. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Epigenetics, you know, the organism, a human organism, an animal organism, is a whole thing. It's not like the brain exists in isolation. I think 
that, for example, exercise, metabolism in general, has a huge effect on the brain. I believe that there are um, studies to support that. There is obviously a very beneficial effect on performance by physical activity, there's no question. So I would never doubt the fact that there is a constant exchange of information, if you want to call it this, or of, uh, in German the word is Wechselwirkung, since you have a German accent. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, there's a constant exchange back and forth between all parts of the body, and that includes the immune system as well. That includes, for example, diseases like Alzheimer's disease, where for sure it's not just neurons that go basically kaput, that break down, but it's a general, it's a fundamentally a disease of the body. So I do believe that in, in brain science, we have to consider how the body feeds back onto the brain, and that that is a, that, I don't think there's anything magical about this. I think there's physical mechanisms that mediate those processes, and I would love to understand them, and we try to, in some ways, take account of these processes in our work, but we are not focused on what I would call neurometabolism. Other labs are doing this. It's a very um, genuine um, research direction, and I feel that most people would be completely in agreement that metabolism has a massive effect on brain performance. So, traditional Chinese medicine has identified a large number of medicinal products that are likely effective. But I feel that these need to be actually validated in clinical trials. I, have a f I strongly believe that we need clinical trials to test whether something actually works or doesn't work. Traditional Chinese medicine is a very successful branch of medicine, but I think that its secret is not only the thousand years of tradition in terms of herbal medicines, but the fact that it fosters a very close patient-doctor relationship, which is part of medicine, but that cannot be measured in clinical trials. That is something that belongs to the practice of medicine of the physician, not to drugs in general. And I think that that's a very positive aspect of traditional Chinese medicine, but that should be separated from the medicinal, medicinal effects of the actual um, drugs. I mean, that's my personal opinion. Follow up on that. To, to follow up, what about the other part of that question, I guess, about the FDA process? Do you have any comments on that, how difficult it is to get a drug into the market? Is it too difficult? Is it about right? Too lenient? So I may be saying something that some of you might not like, but I think that the FDA is doing generally a good job and that we need that kind of stringency and scrutiny of drugs in order to make sure that we don't give people stuff that doesn't work or that can even be bad. And if anything, I would worry about the FDA being too lenient instead of being too stringent because I feel that we need to have drugs that people can trust and not drugs that may or may not work. And so I'm, I'm personally not overcritical of the FDA. And even by the so the question is, what is Tom's view on the usefulness of technologies that allow um, real-time, I guess, observation and imaging? Okay. Well, it depends on, on, on the question, but for example, for, you could easily imagine that for a screening, they're going to be very, very useful. Um, Technology is changing neuroscience very rapidly, and there's many different types of technologies that are new. We live in a completely different era. Most neuroscientists think about things like optogenetics. I'm not sure that that's very useful, but I think what's incredibly useful is Sky OEM, which has changed 
how we see molecules. It's unbelievable. We can see stuff that we could never see. And for drug development, that will be uh, very, very important. Um, RNA-seq, single-cell RNA-seq, is changing how we do science. Um, certainly, um, light sheet microscopy, super-resolution microscopy has the potential of getting at mechanisms, so I can see that this might have a deep impact on biotech. Although, you know, in the end, what's really important is having a good disease model, a good question, a good, <laughs> something to grab onto, yeah. <laughs> we have time for one last question. You get it, because you've been trying so hard. Yeah, so the question uh, has to do with, is there enough transparency? Obviously, you think there's not. Does that affect what drugs get funded, what drugs get into the market, um, how successful companies are? And I, I believe you've actually written about this topic at one time. So it used to be a problem. I don't think it's a huge problem anymore because you're, sub you're required to register your drug trials. You're required to publicize the results. Um, I recently just read somewhere, I think it was the other day, that virtually all big pharma do. Sanofi failed to report one out of, I don't know, 100 trials. Um, it's a requirement now, so it's not a problem anymore. The problem is more ingrained in small trials that are performed by universities and hospitals and that are sometimes not transparently handled. Um, of course, I mean, you're absolutely right. There has to be absolute transparency. Every clinical trial needs to be registered and needs to be reported. There's no question about it. Otherwise, it's lost um, knowledge, which would be bad. So, yeah. I'm going to take one more because you look so disappointed when you didn't get that last question. This last one for sure. So to repeat the question is, what is Tom's opinion on the effects of childhood trauma on, on the brain, and uh, what should we be doing to prevent childhood trauma, or the effects of it? The effects. The effects of childhood trauma. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I am very much in favor in terms of preventive medicine. I think that that's really what we need as a society, more than anything, because Many of the prevalent disorders, you know, are basically um, linked in risk, although not completely, to uh, lifestyle. You know, obesity is a typical example, right? Having said this, the area of childhood trauma is something I just don't feel comfortable about commenting because I don't know enough about it. It makes sense to me that it should be prevented. It makes sense to me that trying to help these people as early as possible may, is plausible, but I don't know enough about the facts, about the incidence rates, about the distribution, about what populations are affected to be able to comment. I just have to admit I'm ignorant. I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, you, you know you're talking to somebody who really knows what they're talking about when they're willing to admit that they don't know. <clears throat> so with that, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, we really appreciate you coming all the way up here on a rainy day. I want to thank you, our audience. Uh, KC runs a tight ship, so we're going to stay on schedule here, and Tom has to get back down to Stanford. So with that, um, thank you again, and I'm going to hand this back to you, KC.